Hi there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. You know, mothers have so much wisdom, whether it's for family recipes that everyone loves or how to find the strength to go on in the face of grief. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, how good is your weather app at predicting the future? And how a mom's spicy chili oil might become the next hot thing. But first, moms know best. How to Lose Everything is a CBC Arts series that features five Indigenous animated short films that explore personal stories of loss. Now, each episode is available in both English and the Indigenous language of the writer. And our next guest is from Southeast BC. Smokey Sumac is the writer and performer of There Are Hierarchies of Grief. Smokey, hello there and welcome to our Vancouver. Hello, thank you for having me. So tell us, what, what was the inspiration for this film? So this film actually came about, I, or I wrote the poem on the day that Trump was elected in the United States. And as a transgender two-spirit person, as an Indigenous person, I was feeling very down. And so I wrote a poem that was to mothers who had lost children because I honored their strength. And basically I know some friends who have unfortunately lost children and I'm always in awe of how strong they have been throughout that process so this is sort of an ode to them yeah and for for you going through your own process where, where did you go for help with this this feeling of grief i think i go to my writing a lot and then i also go to um, other people who have experienced it so the creator of this entire project krista couture for example has a memoir how to lose everything and that's how where the inspiration came for this group of films and I actually have read so many grief memoirs and that's one of my favorites because I find our work of artists and writers can help us know that we're not alone. Yeah, good point. And uh, again, those conversations with other mothers who have experienced loss too must have been helpful. What, what, what did you learn from some of them? I think grief is such a long journey. And so the biggest gift that I got was honoring that and so for example I had I had lost uh, somebody very close to my life and I called a few of my friends some of them that are in this poem and Krista actually said to me at one point I'm so sorry and I wish that I had words to say that it, it it's going to be okay but it's a long journey and I just hold that space for you and I think that is such a gift for us to be able to feel whatever we're feeling in those moments. All right, but uh, one thing is feeling what you're feeling, and another thing is to to put it, to, to create this work. So how did you go about creating the film? So I've been so incredibly lucky to be part of this project. I, I had written the piece, and the piece came very quickly on that day, and this poem sort of had a life of its own. And then when I got to work with an animator and see it visualized and to have this conversation and to share our, our grief stories together, it really became something new. And I think you'll see that with the film. It's, it's very different than reading it on a page. It's been, it's really brought it to life and offering something for everyone out there. Yeah. And we are going to be able to see it in just a moment, but I, I'd like to hear from you, you know, what, what does it mean for you to have this film, you know, widely available in the Tunaka language too? It's unbelievable. So Chinooka is a language isolate and we have about 20 speakers left. Um, and so we're, we are a very endangered language and we have language revitalization happening all over our nation. I'm very excited about the young people doing the work, but to have this level, to have our language out there for anyone to be able to, to watch on CBC, um, on CBC Gem is just so, I, I have no, I almost have no words because uh, this language, I didn't think I'd ever be able to learn and to be able to actually do this work with my elders and with my uncle who helped me do the translation and helped me do the recording. It's a gift to reconnect to something that I thought was lost. No, me. well put, well put. And you know, there's this film, it may have been inspired by 
a particular incident or a particular moment of grief. But how do you think these kinds of lessons or, or messages can help a broader range of people deal with their grief? I think that unfortunately in these years of the 2020s, we, we understand there's been such a big grief around all of us, whether it's the pandemic, the isolation, all of those kind of things, or if you're facing the death of a close person. And so I believe that this speaks to a universal experience. And we hope with the entire project that our pieces are connecting to you and help you feel and own some of your grief stories as well. Smokey, really great to connect with you today. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And now here is Smokey Sumac's full short film, There Are Hierarchies of Grief. First, your heart will break. My mother got lost in the woods and never came back. I could list so many other things lost to English. I think of shooting stars, of our star. Your heart sounds like a powwow. On days like these, my heart thinks of you. When the rest of the world grieves for a world they think is gone. When we've awoken to a nightmare we didn't think was possible. When I'm afraid that I can't make it to the next sunrise and I don't know if the tears will ever stop. When smiling seems like it might be a failure. On days like these, I find strength in your presence like a lighthouse on fire in a storm I couldn't find my way out of alone. You once told me the kitchen floor is the best place to cry, recommended crawling to the refrigerator and crying to the beat of its hum, gave us all songs to introduce us to the grief you fell in love with, your generosity flowing from fingertips on that piano you don't play, in poems and recordings, wrapping its arms around me and telling all of us we can stay. It's possible, even when you've known a grief such as this. You told me I was like your child so close to his age. Opened the door and hugged me, let me lie hung over on your couch until I got sober again. Texted, I need you trusted me enough to ask for help. You were honest when you told me you needed to go to his gravesite alone. It's his mommy time. You gave me the only picture I have of he and I together. Told me stories, of memories I don't have anymore. And you gave me three more cousins too. To hug and to hold and to laugh with. And even if I don't see you enough, you've given me family here. And on days like these, I think of you, my girl. The length of you wrapped in scarves and borrowed jewelry, a skirt made of stars. I think of the trust you refuse to stop giving as you get in the car, on the bus, on the plane. I think of the ocean, your voice keeping us warm like the Mediterranean sun. Back in September, when I went to the West Coast, I found some little path between great big houses on our way to the ferry so I could swim for you both. I think of shooting stars, of our star, of the way you laugh and how you get quiet. I think of how you taught me to carry and take care of the feathers and showed me where your little star so strong brought down a tree so we could be with the water. On days like these, my girl, I close my eyes and listen for your harmonies as we learn to sing together in North Dakota, in Flint, Michigan, somewhere in Wisconsin where you kept us warm and I kept us covered, where you kept us fed and I kept us moving. 
On days like these, my heart thinks of you and the love I am filled with because you are here. And I know there have been mornings worse than this one. I know that there is more strength in us than we can ever imagine. I know that the only truth is the sun will rise and fall and rise again. Spring will come and winter and fall again. And I'll keep giving and loving and singing and crying and swimming and visiting. I'll keep on. Thank you, our mothers. I love you. It's time for one of our favorite features of the program. This is where we get to showcase some of the photographs that you send in. Thank you in advance. First up is Sherry Blaker, who snapped this happy eagle sitting in a Surrey tree after feeding on spawning salmon. Just stunning, Sherry. Thank you so much. And Jody Simmons shared this beautiful photograph of the waves of Rocky East Beach in White Rock. Jody, thank you. And finally, the Anukshuk at Vancouver's English Bay looks amazing in this photograph by Cheryl Smith. Just wow, look at the color of that sky. Yeah, so please send in more photographs. It's easy, just email your favorites to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, Johanna Wagstaff is back with more Planet Wonder on CBC Explore. So this is a program about climate science and the impacts of climate change. So here's an excerpt now from episode three, where Johanna asks, how reliable is the weather app on your phone? What's the weather in five months for my wedding? I don't know. <sighs> you said it wasn't gonna rain. Actually, I did. Now you might think I smirk at our use of weather apps, but I actually love them. I think it deepens our relationship with weather. I just know it's not my forecast and I worry about our reliance on them during extreme weather. So that got me wondering. How reliable is the weather on your phone? After 15 plus years of weather forecasting, it still amazes me that we can see the future. I mean, predict a hurricane or a heat dome that literally doesn't exist yet. Just particles in the atmosphere that will likely come together in a way that will dramatically affect people. We've come a long way to get to the point where this forecast just shows up on your cell phone. It wasn't until the 19th century that the Western science of weather forecasting really began, out on the ocean. The electric telegraph meant weather reports could be transmitted from sea to a nearby port faster than the clouds could travel. Game changer. But these early forecasters were really just following the movement of storms without understanding the science behind it. It was Norwegian meteorologists in the early 20th century who worked out the mathematical equations which govern the physics of the atmosphere, the same equations we use today. Thank you, Norwegians. Tuck. Forecasts have become more accurate as we've obtained more data, especially from satellites, and developed super fast computers. There's something else that makes meteorology such a unique science global cooperation. National agencies create their own forecasts, but knowing what the atmosphere is doing in one country helps the forecasts in another. That collaboration is more important than ever. 
climate change is not only increasing extreme weather, it's impacting poor countries the most, i.e. the ones that don't have those supercomputers. So what does this all mean for the weather on your phone? To get some perspective, I met up with Chris Doyle, who's done pretty much every kind of forecasting you can imagine, including being chief meteorologist for the 2010 Olympics. Chris, it's so nice to finally meet you. I've been following you for years and, and you know, I seem to learn something new about meteorology every day from you. So nice to see you in person. Oh, it's lovely to see you, Joanna. And this is a spot that you come out to quite often. Why, why do you love it out here? I just think it's uh, it's sort of a part of nature, very close to the city. And you're sort of in the weather too. Which you is, totally are. You yeah. can see the sky better here than anywhere else. <laughs> I wanted to start with a question that I get all the time. I'm sure you do too. How reliable is the weather on your phone? Well, it kind of depends to a certain extent what app you're using. So there's one produced by Environment Canada called WeatherCan, I believe it's called. And that, that takes the forecast produced by meteorologists at the Pacific Storm uh, Centre in Vancouver and sort of translates it into icons and small amounts of text and drops it on your phone. And that's produced by people that are looking at the weather 24-7. A lot of apps take information directly from weather models, digital information that create a, a sort of automated forecast hour by hour for really as long as you like. Um, and there's no human inter intervention in that. So if there's problems in those app forecasts early on, they're not gonna be corrected. So mm -hmm. they can be misleading. Hold up, let's hear what you think about those weather apps. How reliable do you think the weather on your phone is? It'll be raining, it'll say oh, it's only cloudy, so I find it's not really that reliable, but it's to help me like coordinate my outfits, so I always check it. My Apple Watch is always on. It's not too bad, it's within one or two degrees, and it, it'll tell me whether it's raining or snowing. What app do you use? I just ask Siri, to be honest. <laughs> it's as reliable as the people on the other end of the information, which, depending on where you're looking, you gotta... I, I take the weather like the news, get multiple sources, and then kind of aggregate them, and you usually get somewhere in the middle some kind of accuracy. Uh, I 100% approve this answer. That is a smart way to use the weather on your phone. And it also depends on the timeline that you're asking for as well. That, that's right. Uh, most apps are pretty good. If they integrate modules that bring in radar and translate into, into a forecast you can use, uh, in the short run. And it also depends where you're asking the question as well and, and how much or how many data points there are around you. Well, that's, that's true. Model quality and forecast quality varies with, sort of varies directly with the number of observations. The more OBS you have, chances are the better at least your short-term forecast is going to be. So if you're in an area that's that doesn't have a lot of data, like you're on the west coast of Vancouver Island, forecasts there are going to be at least sort of in the short to medium term less reliable than one well inland where you're in a highly populated area. Forecast? That's my jam. Come with me as I take you through the art of looking into the future, aka let's do a weather forecast together. Now, the basis of every forecast when you're looking into the future is understanding what's happening now because you can't move the atmosphere forward in time until you understand what it looks like right now. And I've got a lot of cool tools to do this. Starting with the satellite, I like to start here with a look at the Pacific Northwest if I'm forecasting for Vancouver. I really get a sense of where the systems are, the shear and twisting. I can even tell what heights these clouds are at. Then I drill down to radar, which is precip happening on the ground right now to get a sense of what's falling from the sky. And most importantly, is taking a look at this gobbledygook. This is weather station data for the Pacific Northwest, and it's an international code in understanding what every weather station is telling us about the weather right now. So where the winds are coming from, temperature, dew point, pressure. And this is where I understand where the fronts and systems are. This is the most important part of my day. So now I have a really good picture of what's happening on the ground, but we have to understand what's happening through the atmosphere as well. So this is a tephagram. Uh, this is the data we get from balloons and it tells us what the atmosphere looks like, the temperature, dew point, the wind direction, and this really gives us a sense of how unstable the atmosphere is. Okay, now we've got the current picture. Let's plug it into the models. 
There's a couple different ways we can do this. I really like to start with putting the fronts and the weather systems on a current picture and then moving it forward in time. So this is giving you a snapshot of the precipitation, the cloud cover, and these white lines are equal lines of pressure, isobars. And you can move this model forward in time to understand how the atmosphere moves forward in time. Accurate forecast saves lives and minimizes property damage. Vital and accurate forecasting is only going to become more crucial in our warming world. Coming up, Johanna will be back to tackle the question, what does climate change mean for winter sports? Whether you've watched Olympic snowboarders in slush or it feels firsthand like the ski season is getting shorter, climate change is impacting winter recreation. And that means winter tourism is facing an uncertain future as winters warm and the snow season shrinks. How that translates to individual ski resorts will depend on a number of factors. The higher the elevation, the better chance of getting more snow events. And the farther inland, the less likely warm ocean systems will have an impact but there's already been a marked change in the way we experience winter. On average, winters in Canada since 1948 have increased by 3.5 degrees Celsius, warming faster than any other season. In order to adapt, many resorts now offer all-season activities, mountain biking being a big draw, but shorter ski seasons will ultimately mean higher operational costs. This is a trend hitting ski resorts globally, and as a result, it's getting harder and harder to find a spot for the Winter Olympics. In 1924, the first Olympic Winter Games held in Chamonix, France, took place on all-natural snow and all outdoors. Nearly a century later, skiers competed down completely human-made runs in Beijing 2022. In a recent study, scientists looked at the venues of 19 past Winter Olympics to see how each might hold up under climate change. They found that by mid-century, four former host cities, including Chamonix, would no longer have a reliable climate for hosting. And by 2080, Vancouver and seven other cities would join the list. And if you think you can just snowmake our way out of this, think again. Ideal snowmaking conditions require a low dew point, ultimately less moisture in the air. And our warming climate is also a more humid one. Not to mention the fact that snowmaking takes energy and water and may further contribute to global warming. Ultimately, the Winter Games outdoor sports will look very different in the future. How different will depend on how countries respond to climate change. And now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thank you so much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. You know, sometimes the next big flavor, it's been in your family's kitchen all along. You know, it could be a favorite family recipe. And that's what our next guest discovered. Annie Nguyen is the founder and owner of Hot Foods. Hot spelled H-A-U-T-E, just like the couture. Annie, hi there and welcome. Thank you for having me. So where did all this start, this, this family recipe and the, the, the taste that, that has just sparked this line? So it's actually funny because when I was a child growing up, um, we would only use this chili oil on one dish, which was a Laotian chicken noodle soup. And I didn't discover how versatile it was until I was in my 20s. That's when I met my husband, Peter. Um, he tried it, and again, with this chicken noodle soup, and he discovered that um, it could be used with everything. We started experimenting, trying it on different foods, like pasta, pizza, rice, just things you wouldn't think of putting chili oil on. I see, so, but who, was, who created the original recipe? That would be my mom. Um, we had this in the back of the pantry, like we only used it once a month when she made this chicken noodle soup. But then I recreated it to make the garlic chips bigger, since that's what everyone loves about the garlic. Um, and I came up with the 
two few spice levels, the right. mild and the hot, because our hot is actually very spicy. Very, very hot. So your mom's original without it have been super hot for most of us? It is, I see. Yes. But sort of more for a North American palate, you had to tone it down a little mm -hmm. bit. Thank you. <laughs> Let me say thank you. I don't know if I can take the super hot at this time of day, but just give me your, your process. You, you slice garlic into chips, and we, we can take a look at some of these samples yes. here. Yes. So this one is the hot chili oil. Mm -hmm. um, so we slice the garlic chips, and then we fry it, and then all the flavors blend into the oil, and then we keep it in the oil mm -hmm. to make it crispy, to keep it crispy. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. So what were some of the challenges then when you go from sort of mom's recipe in the back of the pantry to now we're go we've got a production line? How challenging was that? That was very difficult. It was actually very difficult to find a co-packer that would take on my project. Um, because of the garlic, mm -hmm. uh, you had, it's very time sensitive, so it had to be cooked perfectly um, so it doesn't burn right. or it doesn't taste bitter. But luckily I found one in Richmond, which is awesome, since he, he's a chef, so he's very um, passionate about food, so it helped a lot getting I, this product perfect to I what I wanted and, it. And is this sold locally? Like, where, where, where do you, where do you it find the It is. The um, we have a few local shops in BC, and we're slowly expanding. Just got into a shop in Montreal and Toronto as well. Um, but hot foods, mm -hmm. hot foods are spreading. Well, let me try something with the mild, please. Sure. <laughs> How would you, you, you brought in a couple of things and, yes. and sort of serving suggestions. Where should we start? Uh, so this is the hummus mm -hmm. that we taste um, actually for conventions and farmers markets that okay, people this love. Is like, okay, this is a good place to start. All right, so, so what I would do is just a Cracker first top. or hummus? You're going to put it, you want me to on dip? On top of the hummus, yes. Right, okay. Oh, okay. Well, you're just going to, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so you would you could just serve that as well. So can I just yep. dip in there? Is, yep. that, is that what you do? Okay, dip you in. A grab little bit of hummus, piece. little bit of garlic. Just something simple like that. It's mm. really delicious. Thank you. This is mild, garlicky, mm -hmm. but I'm getting the crispiness of the of the garlic slices as well. Right. Oh. How is the heat level? No, that's that's perfect for me. <laughs> okay. That's perfect. So that's the mild one. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting and, and this one sort of similar idea. You just have cream cheese. Cream cheese. This one I usually just eat with the garlic oil. So the garlic one is just all big chunks of garlic mm -hmm. with no spice at all. Mm. So this is I'm something I would crunching. eat for breakfast. You would when have cream want. cheese and garlic for breakfast. Yes. Okay. 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 There's so. something for everyone, Annie. <laughs> this will get you set for the whole day. And then. Really? Okay. I don't want to take a bite of that just yet, but I, I see. Okay. There's another. There. You don't have to worry about hot, but you could put the hot on there. You're just, you're just you not could. going too hot. Yes. In, for breakfast. But for right. breakfast, yeah. And also, so you talked about pizza, spaghetti. Now, I know uh, there are some pizza places that will have either a rosemary oil or a chili oil. So it's mm -hmm. that kind of thing. This goes beyond the chili oil because you've got the chunks the garlic, in there as well. Yep. It's like, now I can't eat pasta without it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is your product. And also, which one would you put on with the spaghetti? You'd probably put the hot one. I, I love the hot. That's the original one. Okay. Um, but for you... Give me a little... Hit me. Hit me, Annie. Well, well, let's go one step up. How's that? One step up? Okay. This is medium, medium yes. hot spaghetti with hot foods. I'm chili gonna give sauce. you one garlic chip because it's very <laughs> spicy. <laughs> well, you can put the other one, the mild one over here. Okay. Maybe I better go for that one. It is still early in the day. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for sharing some of this uh, hot food condiments with us today. And it's going to be really interesting to see where all this goes for you. Thank you. We so wish much. you well. Here's to not too hot, all right? <laughs> So tu fais mon Kenya, Kilimanjaro, petit black au Kenya, Kilimanjaro, tu me rends la marsera, Kilimanjaro, so tu fais mon Kenya, Kilimanjaro. Now, if you want to go out and see some live music, Montreal's Pierre Quenders will be at the Fox Cabaret February 9th. Knock, knock, knock on your door, kiss you on the porch, get you up in this four by four, girl, before you put him down the phone. And rural Ontario duo The Reckless return to the Commodore February 11th. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. And you know, one of my favorite elements in a song is a very simple sound that comes from your lips. I always earmark whistling in pop songs because it struck me that the simple act of pursing your lips together and whistling 
will often form the most memorable hook in the song. Here's a few other famous examples. Sitting on a darker bay, wasting time. See me in Julio, down by the schoolyard. There you go, the video is from 1988. The song is from 1972. Yes, that was Paul Simon with the great tune, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard, that features that awesome whistling solo. Before that, from 1968, Otis Redding's posthumous hit, number one, Dock of the Bay, with the unforgettable whistling coda to end that song. Now here are two recent hits that feature whistling as the opening hook. Going back to 2006, that is the haunting and unforgettable whistling from the song Young Folks, an international hit for the Swedish band Peter, Bjorn and John. And I remember first hearing that song being played in a club by a DJ and I remember pushing to the front asking her, what is this song? All because of that whistling. A brand new Canadian hit song that features a whistling hook is currently climbing the CBC Music Top 20 right now. Check it out. That's the Beaches from Toronto with their latest hit, Grow Up Tomorrow, which features, yes, whistling. I'm Grant Lawrence, and I challenge you to put together your own whistling playlist. Grow Up Tomorrow by the Beaches can be your first song. I'll check in with you again soon. Coming up, burning away the tears, at the National Gathering on Unmarked Graves. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, the three-day National Gathering on Unmarked Graves in Vancouver, it focused on the efforts of Indigenous people to access records in order to better understand the tragedy of residential schools. But, as Wamish Hamilton found, there was also a heartbreaking ceremony that involved sacred tears. The conference in downtown Vancouver is about data sovereignty and controlling information. Accessing records, church archival material, and other relevant documents has been a significant barrier for families and communities doing searches. This week's conference is the third in the National Gathering on Unmarked Burials series. Previous conferences were held in Edmonton and Winnipeg. This conference centers around data, but Phyllis Webstead is here to support fellow residential school survivors. She's also here to help heal her own trauma. Webstead wishes speaking her own language could be part of that journey. 
I wish I knew my language so that I could have words to properly describe my feelings and what's happening. My mom is fluent, so I've always wanted to sit with her and to come up with some words because the English language does not always cut it when it comes to feelings and emotions. Phyllis and her mother requested and received their own residential school records. The postal boxes remain unopened though. Holding the papers and reading about their stolen childhoods is too daunting yet. I requested my records from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I scanned the documents, but I have yet to sit and really look at it. Um, I haven't been ready. Non-Indigenous people need to heal from this experience too. There's no longer any reason not to know what from, Phyllis said. There's no longer a reason for Canadians not to understand what happened to us. There's no excuses anymore. And uh, we just need to keep um, talking about it, keep feeling, keep feeling the feelings. And that's what we're doing today. Survivors and supporters dab away their tears with Kleenex, which they then place in large brown paper bags at each table. Today we're going to light the fire and we're going to burn the tissues. We're going to burn the tissues that have been gathered through this event. The Kleenex is there to collect that hurt, to collect that pain that our people have gone through. And it's not to be garbage, to, to be let go and put into the fire. In this space, where the damage from residential schools is being discussed, it's a wonder we are witnessing the ceremony at all. Like survivors who were here, it also endured the onslaught to eliminate it. Wami Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, how the new mayor of Prince George came up with a fresh Chinese name for the city. Welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now to mark Lunar New Year, the mayor of Prince George gave his city a special gift, a new poetic Chinese name. Simon Yu is the city's first mayor of color and of Chinese descent. And he says he took in several considerations when choosing the name. When I learned that it is very difficult to translate the Prince George, exactly into Chinese. So I just thought, you know, if there's a way without changing the meaning of a Prince George, and yet we can let the, the more people know about this area. And uh, so I just thought that the unique feature of a summer lake, um, perhaps um, is the way to go because it sounds, the direct translation is PG. P is a, it's a very rare uh, used word. It basically really means uh, continental uh, watershed divide. That's what, that's what it is. And the second word is the base. You know, normally it means it's a mountain, it's a foundation. Um, so the sound is exactly G. So the PG, that two words, uh, it means a, 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 on this rock, the water started going to different directions. So that's exactly what uh, Summer Lake is. My grandfather, when I came to Canada, gave me some of the, his uh, writings. He explained to me some of the meaning behind it. And so I, I always find it's very interesting. So over the years, I just uh, took on it as a hobby and uh, practiced uh, the periphery a little bit. I'm, I'm not very good because I don't have a teacher. <laughs> I just basically just... Uh, uh, doing a bunch of imitations to see what I see, other, how the people, other people write. Um, but over the years, uh, this, this is the result. I became the head of the city, so I thought it was uh, my ob obligation to share a little bit of my cultural background with the city and with the people I love. And uh, 
But actually, the Chinese tradition in Prince George area is uh, very deep. Um, the Chinese came here when they built railway, and we've been settling here ever since. Actually, I'm the latecomers. Um, I've only been here 50 years. Many family I know has been here for quite a few generations. Um, so the tradition of celebrating Chinese New Year, actually, it goes back when the, when the railway came, the Chinese came, the celebration came as well. You know, from Twitter to TikTok, it seems there's always a new way for people to connect. Well, back in 1988, desktop publishing spawned a new revolution in communication, newsletters. So here's Fred Langan with a story from our CBC archives. Business people used to think writing was a bore. Annual reports were torture, newsletters something the competition produced, and memos a necessary evil. Now we're in the middle of a paper explosion. Canadian business types can't wait to get to the office and use the new toys, especially the computer wired up to the laser printer for desktop publishing, a hot business buzzword. Jeanette Hanna works with a design firm called Spencer Francie. Okay. Along with designing for corporate biggies, she also counsels them on the ins and outs of desktop publishing. The perception that everybody has is somehow desktop publishing is just doing a lot of newsletters. And I think that's a, um, grossly underestimating what the potential of all this is and the reality of what it is. You may say, I build airplanes, but what you do is along with that airplane, you produce literally a ton of documentation all the material that all the documentation for a 747 supposedly won't fit inside a 747. Here's how desktop publishing works. Using the little signs on the screen, the designer clicks the mouse, that's the gadget in her hand, and the page expands on the screen. Then the style of type can be changed, lines can be drawn, and graphs put in. Over the past two years, more than 200,000 desktop publishing programs have been sold. Graphic artist John Orr uses a computer to draw, design, and edit. And with his computer, he can work faster and cheaper than the competition. Last year, he did a technical manual for Algoma Steel. It meant lots of detail work, such as changing numbers from metric to imperial and back again. And with the computer, it makes it easy to underbid the competition. Because I'm designing the project and, and handling the typesetting right here, uh, we lose a number of steps and markups along the way. So we can, we got better control, it's faster and uh, less expensive. Art shops and graphic designers aren't the only ones in on this. Number crunchers can get creative as well. This is the corporate finance department of McLeod Young Weir, the place where they do the deals, raising money for companies. As with the graphic artist, the pencil here was once king, tallying columns of figures, juggling financial ratios to judge the health of the company and tell them how much money they should raise. Now, it's done on computer. Wiring the department with easy-to-use computers gives McLeod a competitive advantage, says Vice President Tom Simpson. Most of the time, you're working on strict deadlines, and you don't have, you know, you don't have time uh, to spend that extra half a day getting typo squeezed out of documents. Usually, you're working right up to the deadline, and the client comes into the reception area, and you just print out that last page on the laser printer, slap it into the document, and you're off to the meeting. The computer and the laser printer are the big winners in desktop publishing. The big losers are typesetters and the corner print shop. Jobs that once cost a bundle and were handled by the experts are now done by amateurs. For Venture, I'm Fred Langer. Now at the end of this program, we like to tip our hats to our talented photojournalists on staff here at CBC Vancouver. They bring us images in their artful ways to give depth and character to the stories that we cover. So here's a sampling from what they saw this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye.